is the living that can praise the Lord. I'm hearing just few voices. Praise the Lord! Hallelujah. I call on Sister Ozioma to share her testimony. Let's clap our hands Good for Good morning, Jesus. beloved. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I just want to thank God very much for Johnny Mercies. Okay. I want to thank God very much for Johnny Mercies, uh, for myself and my colleagues who traveled. Uh, we traveled for a while. I haven't been in church for like four Sundays. So I really thank God for taking us and bringing us back in. We had a very different experience from what we would usually have. We were on sea for quite a while. And the sea, I must say, is a very different experience from land. It was just like a different world altogether. But I really thank God because God took us there. We had some challenges. There were times when the vessel we were on would, you know, because of rain. And whenever it rains, the sea is usually quite turbulent and all. But, you know, God saw street all. He brought us back. We were successful. We had some other challenges with regulators and clients and the rest of it. But God took us there and brought us back in safely. And we did everything we had to do very well. So praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The way we are clapping, like we are clapping for Stauzioma. We thank the Lord for Johnny Messis, for preserving her through when she went for on her work trip and God brought her back safely. Not just her, but everyone that was on board with her. We give God all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. And I know today is someone's time to receive a miracle from the Lord in Jesus' name. Clap your hands for Jesus one more time. Amen. Hallelujah. Alright, it's giving time. We want to give to the Lord. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together. And running over shall men bring into your bosom. If you need an envelope, call the ushers. Just lift up your hands. The ushers will give you one. If you're online, the giving details are there. And if you want to do a transfer, you can see that on the screen. Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't need to say much. Uh, I think there's a video I wanted to play. Is the video ready? All right. Uh, just listen to the video, then I'll come back to say some things. All right. Media, can we have the video, please? Play. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, Thank sir. You. Yeah, what's up? Question for you. Yeah. Is this your Rolls Royce? Uh, yeah. And what do you do for a living out here in Tampa to be able to afford a Rolls Royce? I am a consultant. Yeah? Business consultant. How long have you been a business owner for? I've been a business owner for 37, th no, 39 years. And could I interview you real quick? I go sure. all over the country just asking business owners advice to new entrepreneurs. Sure. What was the most amount of money that you made in a single year? Most amount of money I've ever made in a single year, 15 million. 15 million dollars. Yeah. Have you ever been broke before? <laughs> I was broke for the first part of my life, then I made millions of dollars, and then I was broke again, and now we've set it up in such a way that that doesn't happen anymore. So what separates middle class from wealthy people in today's world? Poor people and middle class people feel like everything's expensive because they pay for everything with money they've exchanged their time for, and they feel like they're paying for everything with their life because they are. Wealthy, creative entrepreneurs, we pay for things according to our creativity. In other words, we create an offer to pay for everything we buy, so everything costs the same amount. And do you believe in God? I more than believe in God. I trust God. How important has faith been for you throughout your career? It's the most important thing in my life. How did you build that relationship and build that trust in God? Maybe to speak to those people that... I received Christ as my Savior when I was 16 years old. I started reading the Bible when I was 17. Every success principle that I learned, the very first thing that I do is I go back and look at Scripture and see if it lines up. If it does, I'll follow it. If it doesn't, I ditch it. You got amazing advice. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. Appreciate I really it. appreciate that. So Good to meet you, young man. Um, to just show something. He said something that struck me. He said he gave his life to Christ at what age? 16. 
started reading the Bible at what age? Then he said, every success principle he hears of or knows, he checks out the scripture to be sure they conform. If they don't, he throws them out. If they do, he practices them. You know what he's saying? This book, this book of the law, is what will give you good success. You practice everything written in it. It's a more guarantee, surer guarantee than anything the world has to offer. So that's why I, I just saw the video. I said, okay, I'll play it in church so that you will know that this thing works, not just because you are in church. It works all across the board. It's part of the success principles of the word of God. Amen. Amen. And part of that principle, listen carefully, is giving. Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given to you. So if you don't give, it shall not be given to you. What shall be given to you? Good measure, pressed down, shaking together and what? Running over. Shall men bring into your bosom. Don't be like the Dead Sea. It keeps taking. And doesn't give out. So nothing lives in it. Nothing survives inside it. So give. And like I said in the first service, when you go to pay someone, you go to a bank. Am I right? Yes, sir. Am I right? Yes, sir. See the church as God's bank. You're not giving to pastor or to church. You're giving to God. And then watch him work wonders in your life. Every There is no prosperity principle that does not include giving. Not just giving to God. I, I said it earlier, but maybe I should recap it. You give to God. You give to your parents. If they are still alive. Or people that represent your parents. You should give them something. They trained you. You give to your spiritual authorities. You give to the poor. In fact, he that gives to the poor lends to the Lord. Each of these giving has a blessing attached to it. When you give to the less privileged, God sees sees it that you're lending to him. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Don't wait till people are in difficulty before and they act before you give them. As it God moves your spirit, give them. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Give to the poor, give to your spiritual authorities, give to your parents. Take care of them. If they are alive. If they are not alive, somebody sold in your life, give them. Then give to God. Giving to God is number one. Don't use God's tithe to give to the poor. Because each blessing is different. If you give to God, his tithe, the ones due to him, good measure, press down, shaking together, running over, shall men bring into your bosom. You give to your parents, God will bless you. Your, it's part of honor. Your days will be long and it shall be well with you. If you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. So when he pays you back, he pays with interest. If you give to your spiritual authorities, he says, God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. That scripture is not for everybody. It's for those who give to Apostle Paul he was praying for. Philippians 4.19. So that's the way of giving. Put, plan yourself like that. Don't eat everything you get to kill you. Did you hear what I'm saying? Uh, you, don't, you don't agree with me. Don't eat, if, don't eat every, everything you get. You eat 100%. It's not healthy to kill you. Give out some. Make, your, make yourself available to, God, to be God's channel of blessings. Does it make sense what we have said? And watch what God will do in Jesus' name. All right. So we'll give tithes offering. Those are givings to the Lord. We give our tithe to acknowledge him as our source. We give our offering to honor him. We don't go to God empty-handed. Then we give our project seed. We build his house. As we build his house, God builds the house. I told you guys I was going to do something, and I will do it. This place is a fertile ground. Did you hear what I'm saying? I so believe in it that I do all my givings here. It's a fertile ground. 
if you give consistently for six months and you don't have a tangible result, come, I will refund you everything you've given. Did you hear what I've said? It's consistently you're giving, tithing, giving offering, consistent, doing what the world says for six months and there is no tangible financial or any other blessing increase in your life. Come, I will refund you every single cover. It's not possible. Amen. Amen. So if you want to give the offering envelopes are there, lift up your hands, your shares will give you. If you're online, the giving details are there and we'll do a transfer. I'm going to pronounce a blessing. I believe this is what God wants me to pronounce from Hosea chapter 2, verse 20. Stand to your feet, lift up your right hand. Hosea chapter 2 from verse 21. Are you ready to receive the blessing? May the Lord answer you and open the heavens over you. Amen. May the Lord answer the heavens Amen. and may the heavens answer the earth you walk on. Amen. May the heavens, may the earth answer you with grain, Amen. with new wine, Amen. with oil. Amen. Everything you've sown in these remaining days of this year, they are declared for you the days of harvest. Amen. Harvest of only good things. Amen. Harvest of only great expectations. Amen. You will not be stranded. Amen. Your expectation will not be cut short. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Shout a louder amen to the Lord. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Shout a bigger amen. Amen. Even when I want to enjoy, even when 
I cry, yeah. When I fall, yeah, na you. When I sing, it's bad. Reji, 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 Papa, na you, oh. Hallelujah. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Worthy, O Lord. we bless your name this morning. We ask that you come in your glory and teach us the living word from your word. Set our hearts right. Set our hearts on you. Thank you because no one will go back the same. In Jesus' mighty name. Now, just before I preach, I want you to sing this song to the Lord. Let it be a prayer. Here I am for you. Come and do what you do. Sing it to him. I've set my heart on you. Come and do. Ask him to do only what he can do in you. Spirit of the Lord, take absolute control. Glorify Jesus. Do supernatural things in this place at this time. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. 
Turn, okay, let's take our confession before we read the scripture. Let's declare boldly one to go. As I sit under the teaching of the word of God, I declare that my heart is a prepared ground to receive the living seed of the word of God. I am focused and do not permit any form of distraction or distortion. As the word comes forth, every need in my life is met. I receive revelation knowledge. I receive light for every dark area of my life. I receive the impartation of the spirit and grace of the world to be a doer. I pull down and destroy every stronghold and high thing in my mind that will challenge or oppose the truth of the word of God I hear. I receive and believe the word I hear today as the truth of God. This word bears fruit in my life a hundredfold as God confirms the word with miracles, wonders and signs in my life. Amen. Separated for blessings. Mark chapter 8, I'll read from verse 22 to verse 26. Mark chapter 8 from verse 22 to verse 26. And Jesus come to Bethsaida and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And the blind man looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored. And he saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now we see here uh, a very interesting story of what happened. The Lord Jesus performed a cure, a miracle of opening the eyes of a blind man. The man was blind. And how did he perform this act? He did it by putting his, using his saliva, his spittle. Can we see that again? Mark chapter 8, verse 23. Can you go to New Living Translation? I want to show something. He was begged to attend to this man. He took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village, then spitting on the man's eyes. Can you allow Jesus spit into your eyes? Can you allow him spit into your eyes? And why did he spit into his eyes? Because in our culture here, we consider spitting as an ob obscene thing, an unclean thing. It seems not to be done. Am I right? So why did he spit into his eyes? When you read the Bible, you have to understand the cultural context within which the Bible was written. In the New Testament, there were three times the Lord Jesus used his spit to heal. This was the second time. The first time was in Mark chapter 7 from verse 31. And I would like us to read it. And then there's another one in John chapter 9. And I will show us something. But I want us to take Mark chapter 7 from verse 31. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came onto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. So this guy, deaf, he can't hear. Impediment in speech, he finds it difficult to speak. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took this guy aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and spit 
and touched his tongue. The first time he did that. Remember, he took him aside to do this. Then, verse 34. Mark 7, 34. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Epheta, that is, be opened. And straight away his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plainly. So this was the first time he did that, using his speech. The second time was where we've read earlier, Mark chapter 8, using his speech on the blind man. And then look at the last one, John chapter 9, from verse 1 to 7. These are not the same stories, different stories. And I really need to bring out something. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Blind from birth. So this guy was born blind. And the idea here is that he didn't have eye socket. Verse 2, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Is he a generational cause? Is he what his fathers, fathers, fathers did? Look at what he answered them. And Jesus answered, Neither had this man seen nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So God allowed it so that he can use him to demonstrate something. And what this tells us is that there are certain things that come to our lives, that happen to our lives, that God wants to use to demonstrate something. It was not that God made a mistake and forgot to put his eyes. Does it make it for that teaching? Verse 4. This is the Lord Jesus that spoke, not an apostle. The Lord Jesus himself. Verse 4. I must walk the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can walk. Verse 5. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And when he has not spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. You know, man was made from the ground. I hope you remember that? From the ground, from the dust of the ground, God formed man. So what he was performing here was a creative miracle. So from that dust, he spat and made clay and anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. So what he did, he used his saliva spat it on the ground, turn the dust as a paste, and put it on the eyes of the man. And then, verse 7, he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by inter interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed, and came see. Now, there are a lot of things I want to show you in the scripture, and I believe the Holy Spirit will give me utterance and give you understanding. Why did the Lord Jesus use his saliva on these three occasions? Because among the Jews, among the Jews, don't go and try it at home and say that's what pastor preached. Among the Jews, it is believed that every firstborn son, the, his saliva can heal. So he wanted to show them that he is the son of God that he claimed to be. So he did it three times because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is what? Established. So he wanted to establish to them that he is the son of God. And the only way to prove it that they will know without doubting is by spitting and using that saliva to perform healing. As they have believed the Son of God. That's the number one thing I want you to understand. To the, that's why, because God gave the Jews all the signs in the world that Jesus is his son. And so when they rejected him, they entered into a curse. As everything happening to them, the Lord Jesus predicted till today. Are you still here? Now, the second thing I want to bring out is that the first two cures, especially where we read in Mark chapter 8, he was in the town called Bethsaida. Bethsaida means house of fish because it was by the coast and a lot of fishermen are there, so they have a fishing industry. And when he came into there, 
they brought somebody and asked, begged him to heal. What did he do? He took the guy out of the town. Why did he take him out of the town? To heal him. Why didn't he heal him there? He took him out of the town, healed him, and told him not to go back there. That means there are certain places God will not do certain things in your life when you remain there. God could not bless them in Egypt. He told Pharaoh, sent to Pharaoh, he said, let my people go so that they can serve me. Why? They can't serve me in Egypt. I can't accept their worship when they are in Egypt. So he took that blind man, that blind man, and took him out of the town. Out of Bethsaida. And watch what he said concerning this town called Bethsaida. Matthew chapter 11, verse 21 and verse 22. Please, I want you to follow what I'm saying. Woe unto thee, Chorazim. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which we had done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So, they were a town where no matter what you do, you can't change their mind. God has stopped proving a point to them. He's tired of that. May it not be your case. Amen. In the name Amen. of Jesus. Amen. Say, woe unto thee. I said, the mighty works that have been done here, if they have been done in another town, it's just like Christianity now in Nigeria. You know, church is everywhere now. But people are not repenting. People are not changing. The, as the, the more we are opening churches, the more the corruption and iniquity is multiplying. Is Bethsaida, Bethsaida and Chorazim. I even asked God, I said, are you sure you sent me to do this work? Because I want to be a missionary. There are people that have never heard the gospel. Now, church is like marketing. You market to get people. You customer service. That's what it's like now. Say, and it's a dangerous thing because judgment is coming. Can't mark my words. And it will start from the house of God. And I'm speaking to you now as a prophet. Go and check the prophecy for the year. God told us here. He said, many prominent lives will be eclipsed. Go and look at what is happening. Ministries in America. You heard of, uh, what's this guy's name? This musician. Puff Daddy. You heard of the just watch. Because God cannot, and I'm speaking to you as a prophet, it's not possible, it's fake to have touches like this. Because the purpose for every miracle, listen carefully so that you understand, the purpose of every miracle, every wonder of God is repentance. Signs and wonders are God's advertisement board to point you to something. They are not the end, they are means to an end. So he said, these people I have done mighty works and what I was looking for was repentance. I have not found it. So when they brought this man for him to do a miracle for, he just took him and said, come out. The miracle that cannot change you, that cannot cause you to change, will later bring judgment upon you. So he took him by the hand and left and led him outside the city and perform the game. When he finished, he told him, don't go back. Don't even share the news with the people there. Somebody getting something? Yes, sir. I can't hear you. Yes, sir. Why did he not heal him in Bethsaida? Because there are atmospheres the supernatural cannot work. There's something I thought of earlier. I said faith environments, creating faith environments. It's on the website. You can listen to it. There. God can't work in every atmosphere. So don't, atmospheres can limit God. Can limit God. So you have to set it. I'll give you just one example. I can give you too much because of time one. Mark chapter 6, verse 2. Mark chapter 6, verse 2. And when the Sabbath day was come, Jesus began to teach in their synagogue. And hearing, and many hearing him, we are astonished. And saying, from whence has this man these, these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him? That even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Now, verse 3, look at what it says. 
Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Hoses, of Judah and Simeon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they are saying, we know him now. He's the one that did the table in my room. That table, that, one, that chair you sat down on, I know him. I paid him for it. I didn't even finish payment. And they were what? Offended at him. Now watch what happened. Verse 4. And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, among his own kin, and in his own house. Verse 5. He could not do any mighty work. The atmosphere was wrong. He can't. What did he do? Just lay hands on a few. Headache, ear pain, leg pain, but nothing mighty. Nothing supernatural. Nothing extraordinary. Why? That atmosphere was wrong. So the supernatural can move. So it's not in every atmosphere God can work. If you understand this principle, you can set miracles in your life. You can time them. You can create the atmosphere for them to flourish. And I think that's one of the biggest privileges of we believers. You can create and time your own breakthrough. Because you create the environment for God to move, for things to happen. Does it make sense what I'm saying? That's why he led him out of that place. Because he, was, he has top proving point to them. And he knows that the environment in that city, nothing supernatural can happen. So can I tell you something that will shock you? The supernatural does not depend on God. It depends on you. Since I can set the atmosphere, that means it doesn't depend, because it's constant. If you want breakthrough, 10 million this week, you know it will happen. If you, that jo- you know it will happen. You just set the atmosphere. Please never forget this principle. If you know how to, and I, 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 can, I will recommend to you because I won't go back to it again. Creating a faith environment. There is an environment where faith flourishes. You remember Jairus' daughter? Remember Jairus' daughter? Yes, sir. When he came there, he saw people crying. Now, on his way, that's Mark chapter 5. On his way to, to heal Jairus' daughter, a woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. Now, Jairus' daughter was also 12 years, but was dead. This woman didn't have access to Jesus. Like Jairus. Jairus was like a pastor, well-known. The daughter died, so he approached Jesus. So they know the this woman doesn't know her. Anybody doesn't know Jesus. She just made up her mind. If I can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. The Lord is rich unto all who, who call his name. Everybody has access. It's your understanding of how to get things done. That matters. So she kept saying in her heart, if I can touch, the, I don't need you to come to my house. All I need is to touch the hem of your garment. I can be healed. So she was, by her confession, as she was going, she was setting the environment for her miracle. And in, in Jews, because the Bible said this woman, she was seeing blood every day for 12 years. Do you know what it means? In those days, there were no menstrual parts, so and the Bible said that the doctors have given up on her. And she just said, no. There must be a way out. So if somebody in that situation can have faith and hope, how much more you? And she started pressing. Started pressing. The press. If you're losing blood, you'll be weak. Am I right? If you have lost it for 12 years, you'll be... Can you, so I want to show you the state. And under the Jewish law, if you're seeing blood, you're not permitted to go in public. So she took the risk. And started pressing in the prayer. People were there, she was pressing. And when she got to Jesus, she touched him. Her faith drew you correct. So your faith can, that's what I'm saying, you can time the supernatural in your life. You can time things to happen. You can set the pace. Hey, I'm waiting for God, I'm praying. No. Create the environment, it will happen. Create the environment, it will happen. Create the environment, it will happen. You are not helpless. You are not hopeless. God is giving you weapons how to do that. So she pressed in and touched. 
when she touched, even the Lord Jesus knew something happened. He stopped. I said, who touched me? Peter said, look at this man. We have 2,000 people present. But that was a different touch. You know, you can stay here today and touch Jesus and go back healed. Go back restored. Go back a billion times more. Do you know that? You can do that. You can get things done here. You can settle 10 years of your life here. You can settle your marriage here. Today, I'm not talking of here. I mean today in this service. You can touch something that will change something. Just a touch. What doctors could not. Thank God for doctors. But there are many things that are more than doctors. And in an instant, it ceased. The blood went. Jesus said, who touched me? And he was looking around and he saw the woman. And the woman came and confessed. And then he proceeded. Now watch something. Many people are waiting until they see pastor or pastor lays hands on them. You don't need it in the New Testament. That woman didn't need it. She went into the future and got what she wanted. That's what faith can do when you have developed your faith. When you create it, when you carry an environment of faith by yourself. You go into the future. What people are waiting for. I mean, the Lord Jesus, that anointing was to heal Jairus' daughter. How do I know? Her ailment was for 12 years. Jairus' daughter that died was 12 years old. Did you get what I'm saying? But she took it first. Before she got to, uh, to Jairus' daughter's house. He took it first. She took it first. So you can take things. When prophetic proclamations are made, say amen, no. The person it is intended for, you can get it before the person. That's how the spirit realm works. Create your own environment. Carry it. Create it. And I'll show you how to create it. So you determine the, temp the temperature of your life. Not Satan. Not circumstances. So as the Lord Jesus continued going, marching to Jairus' house, they came. In fact, immediately that miracle happened. Read that story well. They came to Jairus. Don't bother the Jesus again. Your daughter is dead. May you not miss your own visitation. Yeah. Jesus told him, don't be afraid. Let's go. So when he got there, he saw people crying. Hey, who? This, who? That, who? Weeping. No, who? The only daughter. Such a beautiful girl. He now told them, she has not, she's not dead, she's sleeping. Because what you say in the midst of trouble matters. Your response, let, 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 let me show you that. Are you here? Mark chapter 5. Verse 30, okay. Let me show you what I was saying. Verse 32. And Jesus looked around to see her who had done this thing. This is the woman of the issue of blood. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith, your faith. So she said the faith. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction, of your infirmity. Now, verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking. You see, the power allocated for this has been taken. <laughs> May you all know be taken. Amen. You didn't say loud amen. amen. That's why when you come to church, your faith is at a lot. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? If that woman had not touched Jesus, I believe that the girl wouldn't have died. Maybe he would have prayed for her to be healed. But look at what the Lord Jesus said. As soon as Jesus heard the word, as soon as he heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of synagogue, do not be what? Afraid. Only believe. So, your response in the middle of a crisis matters. Your verbal, what you say matters. How you react matters. When it seems all hope is lost, it matters to God. It matters in the realm of the spirit. Are you there? Yes, 
Some people, things happen, you start shaking, you think the worst of it. No. We have a God who cannot lie. We have a God who is all powerful. We have a, the, the worst thing that can happen to somebody is to die. God, God has the power to raise the dead. That's why God loved Abraham. When Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, he told the servants that accompanied them, I and my son Isaac, we are going to the mountain. Stay here. We are going to the mountain to worship and we will return. Not that I will return. Look at what he, because he was going to sacrifice Isaac. He was the only person that knew what was going to go on. But he has, he had a no faith that even if he sacrificed Isaac, born him to death, God can raise him back to life. That's the kind of faith you should have. It changes everything. So here, the Lord Jesus told Jairus, don't be afraid. Only what? Believe. Tell your neighbor, only believe. I want you to believe that God is powerful, that he can do anything. I want you to believe that with God, hope, there is still hope. As long as there is God, there is still time. Even if the time has run out, he's the one that created time. He can elongate it. I, I, I had someone I prayed for uh, some years ago. A position in his company. He was not qualified to get it. He was not up to 40. That position, you don't get it till you're 45, 50. Because after that, there's nothing else left. So they do it in such a way that you have to get to 45, 50. So he came and we agreed in prayer. Because I, I know the scripture. We agreed in prayer. They conducted, they appointed somebody. Then we, after we prayed, a week after that, he got back to me. He said that that appointment, the board nullified it. And they are starting afresh. I said, that's right. We have started now. They did the interview. The second, the, the, we, we are talking. Then, at the last stage, he came second. And they told him, even though you came second, we are still going to take him. May it be your testimony. Amen. May God qualify you for what men have disqualified you for. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You better get something. You better say Amen. So he, he walked there and told him not be afraid. So, so when he got to the house, look at what he said. I'm teaching you how to create your own faith environment. Verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Now look at the next verse. Then he permitted no one to follow him. Except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So the multitude that we are going, he stopped them. Now the game has changed. He needed to set an environment. So he separated himself with the people who believe like him. So what he's also teaching us is that at a point in your life, don't go with the multitude. Separate yourself. If you want to get to certain things, there are certain issues and matters of your life, you can't get with the multitude. In the midst of the multitude, you need to separate yourself. So he permitted no other person to follow him, except only these three. Verse 38, then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult. Those who wept and wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? This child is not dead, but sleeping. What you say in the middle of a crisis matters. You are writing your report card by your verbal response in the middle of a crisis. You are writing it. It's too late, God, though. You are writing it. Things are difficult, though. You are writing it. Whatsoever you say, as they have spoken into my ears, so I will do to them. So he got to where a child confirmed dead was. What did he say? Why are you making commotion? This girl is sleeping. She's not dead. It's not over. When people are sleeping, we wake them up. When they are dead, we can't do anything. But it's how you're seeing it that matters. Verse 40. And they ridiculed him. So get ready when you're speaking faith to be ridiculed. 
Faith is not faith until there is a ridicule attached to it. Did you hear what I'm saying? Faith is not faith until people mock you, ridicule you. You have not entered faith. The test he gave to Abraham changed his name at 99. Father of many nations. The wife, 89. Mother of many nations. From today, start calling and announcing that name. And didn't you know that people mock them? But when he had put them all outside, did you see that? So he separated himself from them to create that environment for things to work. The supernatural can work under all circumstances. And I want to tell you that you are the master of your own destiny. I want to tell you that. That that thing you've not gotten is not God, it's you. Create the environment, it will happen. This is the Lord Jesus creating his own environment. Uh, are you getting what I'm saying? He put all of them outside. He took the father and mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. So every other person, because the father and the mother, they want the child back. Every other person may not want, but they, they must have faith. And then the three people with him. And look at what he did. The, now, I want to ask you something. Are you still here? Yes, sir. A, a whole Jesus created his own environment. How do, who do you think will work if you don't create your own? First of all, he stopped the multitude. Then he came to the house, watched his words. He spoke only what he believed, that this child is not dead. He's sleeping. What you say in the midst of a crisis matters. Verse 41, then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talita Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately, the girl arose and walked, for she was how old? Twelve years. So you see how we created the environment for things to happen. If you create that environment, God will come. But part of creating the environment is separation. There are things you separate from your life if you want certain things to happen. Things don't just happen. Things don't just happen. You set them in motion. You create them. It is not dependent on God. The supernatural is always constant. Because God is always God. God doesn't change. It is we that change. We are the variables. We are not the constants. God is the constant. And where God is the constant, the supernatural is the constant. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So we, I can set. I, I love what Bishop Edebo used to say. He said, every day is God's day. The day you believe is your day. So the day you believe is the day you set the supernatural. Set your life to receive the supernatural and it will happen. So you have a responsibility. And let me please tell you, every faith that leaves all responsibility to God is an irresponsible faith. It won't work. You have a part to play. Your part is to set the environment and watch God move. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Let me tell you, according to scripture, if we want to set the environment, things that we must constantly separate ourselves from, according to God's word. I, don't, I may not have the time to show you the things we should be doing, but I taught that one in creating faith environment. You create your faith environment. But I want you is on our website. But I want to teach you who you must separate yourself from if you want to walk in the supernatural constantly. Do you want to know? Yes, Give Jesus a big clap offering, somebody. <laughs> First Samuel chapter five. Did I say First Samuel? First Corinthians chapter five. From verse nine.
I wrote unto you in an epistle, in a letter, not to company, keep company with fornicators, those who are sexually impure. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with the idolaters. For then must you needs go out of the world. So what he's saying here is that he wrote a letter earlier to this church, the Corinthian church, that they should not keep company with people who are sexually impure. So he now told them, I'm not talking about the world, because that's what is normal in the world. But he's saying that if you have to separate yourself from everyone who is sexually impure, then you have to be raptured out. As long as you are in the world, you will meet these kinds of people. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Are you here? Now, I want you to understand something that as believers, we've been called out from the world. God called us out. That is our distinction. If we lose that, there is nothing special in our lives. Verse 11. But I've written to you not to keep company. If anybody that is called a brother, a believer in Christ, falls under these categories. And you must, you see, anybody that says they're a believer and they do this, he says, for the supernatural to work in your life, protect yourself. Watch what he says here. If anybody who is born again is a fornicator, is covetous, is an idolater, is a railer. Railer is somebody that is very, very abusive, that talks a lot, doesn't have control over their words. Is a drunkard, always going to parties, always clubbing, soft life, and an extortioner. With such a person, don't even eat. Don't share the same food with them. You know why God said we should separate ourselves from these six things? Do you know why? Because they are infectious. They will contaminate you. They are highly communicable spiritual diseases. You will start doing living like them. And when you start that, the first law fails. And what's that first law that fails there? You can't set even the own internal atmosphere within you for faith to work. Because if faith doesn't work in you, it can't work outside. The failure of faith is first failure within. Because any man under condemnation can't have faith. Does it make sense? Let's go through that again. Anybody who says they are born again and they are living, they are sexually impure, very loose. He says, run from them. It will contaminate you. And it will contaminate you. Your faith will not work. Because faith works with a good conscience. Faith. That, don't fake it all. Real faith, genuine faith works with a good conscience. Let me show you what's good conscience. You go to God, the prayer, with his word, that God has stirred up in your heart. And you say, Lord, but you said in your word. You, you know, you can't, there's a scripture, God says, concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. Am I right? Are you still here? Give Jesus a big clap of prayer. I need to be sure I'm in the right way. He said, concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. You can't do that too without a good conscience. A good conscience means you don't have offense towards God or men. So you stand before God and challenge him. You know, the Lord Jesus said, in my name, pray, one. In my name, make demands. There are certain things in your life where that they will not answer to prayer, petition. They will only answer to demand. You can't make those demands if you don't have a good conscience. Good conscience. But if you're, if you're defiled on the inside, 
You can't have good conscience. Good conscience to stand before God boldly and say, I demand this. I demand that this will happen. I mean, I was in a, I was in a challenge. A tr- big trouble, not challenge. This one is big trouble. You are chasing me out of the house. I've prayed. I've fasted. I've supplicated. It just came to my spirit that this is not petition, supplication. This is a demand though. This one, you have to be violent to get it. So I went to God. My wife is a witness. She's in children's church. She would have testified. We were coming back. They are chasing us. I was looking for where to keep load. I can't take church money to pay rent. We are even looking to get a land then. I said, God. So I got angry in the spirit. So I told God, I said, I've done everything that I need to do. This money is on earth. I've prayed enough. Where is it? Who has the money? I'm demanding for it. I'm not praying. I am placing a demand. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's the prayer that delivered Jacob. There's a prayer of demand. You do it when you have good conscience. Not just faith. Faith with a good conscience. There are certain things in your life, in your destiny that will not come. Except you pray that kind of prayer of demand. That's how I also got married. First courtship, trouble. Second one, trouble. I said, no, something is wrong. I went to God in prayer. I said, no, this thing cannot continue. It cannot continue. And I made a demand. But you can't you can have that boldness. The Bible says having boldness to come before God. You can't have that boldness if you're defiled on the inside. Because faith will not carry it. And the basis upon which you receive anything from God is faith. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So he said, it's very, and you see, this is very vital to the supply chain of blessings in your life, at in your life. This is part of the reason I don't live in sin. I want the channels to be clear. I want to approach God boldly. The righteous should be as bold as a lion. There's nothing I can ask. Him. Not bold face, so bold in the spirit. You know why they say the lion is bold? Huh? Because it's not that he's the biggest or largest. It's courage. It has courage. It has boldness. To confront any animal. We should be like that. Does it make sense? Say so any a fornicator does lose morally. You should have discipline. You should have self-control. Number two, covetous, greedy, greedy person. All they are chasing for is material things. They want more and more of it. Say, don't be friends with those kind of. Don't rule with them. You will become greedy. Let me. Maybe I should read a bit from the scripture. Why did God say we should not be greedy? Proverbs 1, verse 19. Look at it there. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 19. We'll come back to this. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain. It takes the life of his owners. So when you're greedy, you will die early. Greed takes the life of his owners. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 16. The prince that wanted understanding is also a great oppressor. And he that hates covetousness shall prolong his days. When you're greedy, you cut your day short. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 27. He that is greedy of gain troubles his house. Not just in life, his own house. So anybody who is a fornicator, who is greedy or covetous. Number three, who is an idolater? Anybody who is, don't, don't, don't let them carry you. They go and ask today. They go to a prophet, familiar spirit. Even if the spirit is saying what they are saying is true, but they don't worship Jesus. Don't go there. They will corrupt you. Acts chapter 16. There was a lady. She had the spirit of divination. She was following Apostle Paul. These are the servants of the Lord. That she was the way of salvation. Day after day. Well, what she was saying, very accurate. Nobody else knew. But it was from the spirit of divination. So it's not that they said it and it came to pass and it's true. What is the source? Does it make sense? And I want to announce to you, God hates idolatry in any form. The occult. 
There's a revival. People say the tradition of our fathers. Foolishness. It's idolatry. Don't keep company. Don't be friends with somebody who is any believer who is a fornicator, who is sexually immoral, impure, loose, lacking self-discipline, who is covetous, who is greedy, number three, who is an idolater, worshiper of other gods, involvement in the occult or secret arts. Number four, a railer, somebody who is verbally abusive, uses foul language. You know, there's a word that is foul language that is popular now, that F word, am I right? It should not come out from your mouth. It should not come out from your mouth. Slanderers. Now, let me show you something. Are you still here? Yes. Is this making sense to you? Yes. How do you know a spiritual person? By their words. Spiritually mature person. By what? Not by speaking in tongues or, or forming that they are pastor, even the title, the words. James chapter 3, verse 2. James chapter 3, verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, in his speaking, the same is a perfect person, mature person. God uses our words a lot to judge us, to judge our state. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Many of us don't know this, but I do words that we speak. The Lord Jesus said we will be brought into judgment concerning them. Matthew 12, 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So even our words, the Lord Jesus said we will give account of them. So there's, there's, we don't have space in the kingdom for idle talking. Just gisting. Because our words will give account. You know why we give account of that? Do you know why we give account of that? Why? Kings. Check many royal fathers. They cover their mouth. Because anything they say is law. Whether in anger or in joy, it becomes law. So they cover their mouth. We are kings and priests unto God. Anything we say is also a law. Words are not just for communication. They are instruments of dominion. Man is the only created being that can speak. There is no other being that can speak on it except man. And it's not just for communication. It's an instrument of dominion. We are the word of a king is dear. That's power. So if you use it carelessly, it becomes useless in your hand. Amen. Amen. Can we go back to that scripture? First Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9. As I begin to round up. I hope you are being blessed today. I like that from the back. Give Jesus a big clap offering. Amen. Let me, this is what God told me. God told me that he doesn't, and it's in the scripture. Those who told me, he doesn't distinguish between words when you're angry and when you're not. Anything you say, the same thing, that's how it is in heaven. And he warned me, he said, you know, your, he told me, he said, your instrument is your mouth. So anything you say, I will do. So be careful. Not just me, everybody here. The same mouth blesses. The same mouth causes. You have to be careful what you say. There are some things, words are like eggs. When they break, you can't pack them. You can't be speaking, 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 speaking. No, just jest, gist, do anything you like. And expect to now go use that same words to go and pray. And I expect God to hear you. No, no. It doesn't work that way. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. In the multitude of words, wanted not sin. So you should actually measure the words you speak every day. Because if you speak too much, you commit sin. In the multitude of words, Proverbs 10, 19. Wanted not sin. You know, Isaiah, when he was called, what did God touch? He stunk. Isaiah chapter 6, from verse 1. He stunk. Talk. Your mouth matters to your destiny. To create a faith environment, your mouth, this your tongue matters. What you speak matters. 
Amen. Amen. Then the next one, a drunkard. Proverbs chapter 23, 20 to 21. I'm a tetola. I don't drink, not even a pint or an ounce of alcohol. Where is it in the Bible? Ah, read the Bible well now. It's what destroys kings, wine and women. That which destroys. Oh, my son Lemuel, give not your life to that which destroys kings. Be not among wine bibbers, among the riotous eaters of the flesh. Every time, ah, let's hang out and eat. Let's hang out. You're just going from one place to another, drinking, clubbing, and eating. Patron will say, I'm spoiling market for them. I'm not spoiling market. <laughs> I'm preaching the gospel. <laughs> say amen. amen. For the drunkard and the gluten shall come to poverty. And drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. That's what the Bible says. The drunkard and the gluten, gluten, somebody that just eats, 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 eats. They say they will come to poverty. Prayer will not change it. When you're drunk, you can't make sound decision. That is the story I read, I read last week. A king, he invaded, he invaded a place. No, they came to invade a place. It's in the Bible. I can't remember the scripture now. Instead of him to focus on the battle, they have not fought battle, they were drinking, rejoicing. So they told him, there were plenty, they told him, young people, some people are coming, oh, what do we do? He said, those that are coming, catch them alive. <laughs> Don't kill them. He said it out of a drunken state. Ah! The people went because they have to obey the king's order. Oh, yeah, let's catch them. They killed them. The person on the water was saying, they've killed the first people. Say, so send another person and catch them alive. Nah, alcohol, they make the decision. <laughs> you can't have a sound mind. And God has given us a sound mind when you're tipsy. Are you uncomfortable? Then the word is for you. You should actually come and sow seed in my life. The third time the same thing happened. Till they got there and destroyed the army. That's how they lost the battle. Why? Drinking. Can we continue? Yes, sir. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 17. Then we'll do the last one and close. Proverbs 21, 17. He that loves pleasure shall be a poor man. And he that loves wine and oil shall not be rich. I hope you know who wrote this book of Proverbs. Who wrote it? Solomon. The richest of the men that have ever existed. This, you see, if you're wise, you learn from the experience of others. That's one of my traits. Because I'm number three in my house. We are five. So I'm in between. So when we are growing up, my elder sister and my elder brother, I saw the way they flogged them. I just said, this thing is not for me. <laughs> so I did. It's because of the experience of others I used to learn. I said, I will not go through this beating. So I will not do what they did. And that's how I've lived my life. So these are the people that have gone ahead of us and written for us. You want to be rich? He that loves pleasure. You like soft life, pleasure. Shall be a poor man. You can have one billion today. If you love pleasure, in boxing, do you know how he's struggling now? He that loves pleasure shall be poor. Pleasure is good, but not all our lives. And then he that loves wine and oil shall not be rich. Are you getting something here? Then the last one, First Corinthians 9. 5 verse 9. First Corinthians 5 verse 9. Extortioner. Talking of swindler. People that get money through fraudulent means. I'll show you just a few scriptures here. I'm helping you and I hope you're receiving it. 
verse 10. So continue to where we are. I think it's verse 10. Yes. And extortioner. An extortioner. What does it mean to be an extortioner? Somebody that extorts people. You should be paid for the work. They don't have to give you something to do your work. They can appreciate you when they f you finish the service. But to insist before you offer service for them to give you extortion. Bribery is when they come and they want you to give you to help them. Extortion is when you insist on receiving before you deliver service and stealing. It's just that you don't have a gun. It also, anybody who is fraudulent falls under this category. Anybody who is a thief. I'll just give you three scriptures and we close. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 11. Everybody wants to make money to be rich. But half durable riches, the ones that last. As the partridge sits on eggs and hatches them not, so he see that get riches, but not by right. Yes, they got the riches, but not through the right way. They shall leave them in the midst of their days. And at the end, the person shall be a fool. So when you get money in the way that is not right, you're setting yourself up for untimely death and for destruction. Look at also Zechariah chapter 5, 1 to 4. This quietness is, I, I'm not really enjoying it. Should I close? No. You guys are too quiet. This is, this is the, I'm telling, you know I love you guys, I hope you know. There are many churches on this axis. There are many pastors you can listen to, but you're here. So the thing, the least I can do for you is to tell you the truth in love. Amen. Amen. Zechariah 5.1 Then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said to me, what seest thou? And I answered, a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Verse 3. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. So there is a flying curse over the whole face of the whole earth. For everyone that steals shall be cut off. That flying scroll. Everyone who swears falsely uses God's name in vain. This curse will rest upon them. Look at the next verse. Verse 4. I will bring it. This is God, do not say that. I will bring it for said the Lord of hosts. It shall enter into the house of the thief. And into the house of him that swells falsely by my name. And he shall remain in the midst of the house. And shall consume it with timber thereof and the stones. So it will remain in that house, not just in the person's life, the house, the family, destroying it. Flying cars. Don't take what is not yours. Don't extort money. Don't get money by fraud. Don't take what is not given to you. Does it make sense what I'm saying? For the young people here, even the meeting, the boss, don't take Psalm 50, verse 16 to 18. I'll close here. Some people will say, ah, pastor, I don't do anything. No, it's not the one I do. But you're helping them. You help them in one way or the other. Psalm 50, 16 to 18. But unto the wicked, God said, what has thou to declare? What has thou to do to declare my status and that you should take my covenant in my, your, my covenant in your mouth? Seeing that you hate instruction, Haters of instructions are always destroyed suddenly. We fly by instruction. Never hate instruction. We fly by it. Seeing that thou hatest instruction and cast my words behind thee. Verse 18. When you saw a thief, you agreed with him. You helped a thief. You know, what I'm teaching is not popular. Many churches can't teach this. So people will go. But this is what God called me to teach. 
to show you the truth that you can be rich in a prosperous way. You can be blessed. I'll close with this. I've been saying I'll close, but this one I'll close. Amen. There's a nation called Switzerland. You know Switzerland? If I give you the passport or the visa, you will go. Am I right? Huh? Um, I can't hear you. Am I right? <laughs> but do you know that Switzerland, a city there called Geneva, used to be the crime capital of the Holy Roman. The crime capital. You can't, they don't enter there to arrest people. But look at how it is. What, what changed? A man called John Calvin, a preacher, came there and started teaching them these things. And as the people transformed, the economy transformed. Because if there is no truth, we can't do business now. Business can't prosper. If we can't keep to time, uh, we can't. Many businesses are closing. It's not because uh, you order something online, they give you something else. You will not order again now. Am I right? Yes, sir. Do, do anybody have the experience here? Yes, uh huh. It's not truth. So, no, no, commerce will not prosper. It's not prayer. It's teaching this thing. No? It's not revival. It's a reformation. Teaching this thing. That there is a wealth that is bigger than riches. That I don't have to compromise to be blessed by God. And so the man started teaching it, teaching them this thing, and they changed. And as they changed, the economy changed. So the first thing they started, two things they are excelling. Banking. And watch. Banking is somebody you trust you can give money to. If you give, put money in the Swiss bank, one million years you will come, they will give you back your money, whether you're a thief or not. So even thieves, they will steal money and run to Switzerland. Because everybody trusts an upright man. That's how we grow, how we get promoted in the kingdom. Can you be trusted? The next one, watch. Watch. When it's nine, it's nine. What does he measure? Exactness. Righteousness. That's how you, if, you, if, you, if you can't keep to time, if you don't have truth, you can't do watch. Are we doing watches in Nigeria? I'm asking, are we doing watches in Nigeria? So that's how we change the economy and we if if wherever you are now the greatest capital you have as a christian is your capital is your character if you can be trusted even a thief a billionaire thief will trust you proverbs chapter 14 verse 34 when you tell people something keep your word rather lose money than lose the word you've given to people did you hear what I'm saying? Keep your word. No matter what. Don't join people to extort, to do things. I have a witness here. Brother Babs. Brother Babs. When I, my last pastorate, he came to do a job. He's here. So if I'm lying, you tell me because I like witnesses. That's how he became close to me. Am I right? So he did the job. I was the pastor in charge of um, uh, vendors. So when he came, the Holy Spirit told me, this is the guy that will do the job. I've interviewed a lot of people. So he get the job, and later he called me to give me an appreciation. I said, no. My salary then was 83000 This was as recent as 2016. 2016. 83000 It was not enough for anything. He called me to say, ah, Pastor, thank you for helping me. I just want to appreciate you. I said, no. I'm not taking it. You know why? Gifts blinds the eye of a judge. He has finished the job, oh. He just wanted to appreciate me. It's not a bribe. Just to appreciate me. I said, no. Why? Because of my position. I can't take it. My position is bigger than the money he's giving me. I saw his heart. And I blessed him. I said, take it. I don't, I don't want Be a person like that. A good name is rather to be chosen than what? Great riches. Proverbs 22, verse 1. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation. That's what I'm teaching you. It also exalts a people, a family. Righteousness, doing what is right. It, you may look slow, but it will exalt you. There are two things the Bible says that three things that exalt wisdom from God, God Himself, and the third one, righteousness. May God give us the grace to live righteously, Amen. to be who we are both in private and in public. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Have you been blessed?
Can we give Jesus a big clap of it today? Stand to your feet and thank him for what you have heard today. Tell him, thank you, Lord, for sending your word. I receive it with meekness. I receive it with meekness. And where you need to bring repentance, can you bring repentance? Because God is setting you on a path. A path of greatness. You may be obscure today. People may not know you today. But you will not end like this. Righteousness exalts. If you separate yourself and create this environment, it's not about just money, running around to get money. No. Get to rebel riches. Not the ones that will leave you in the midst of your days. Get to rebel riches. Not the one that will bring curses into your house. Where you need repentance, can you bring repentance to the Lord? And say, Father, I didn't know this. Please forgive me. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. Ah, Malikate Zagudabaya. The face of the church in Nigeria is changing. And I'm speaking as a prophet. The face is changing. The face of the church is changing. I am telling you by the word of the Lord. A great change is coming. Can you be part of the remnant that will enjoy that change? Receive grace from the Lord today. Receive grace. Receive grace. Receive grace. Receive grace. I see many great destinies here. Many great destinies. But God asked me to tell you, Noah didn't build the ark when the rain started. He built it before the rain. God is building your own ark by sending you this word. As you're building it, people will laugh at you. But God said, I should tell you, you will laugh last. You will laugh longest. You will laugh the best. In the name of Jesus Christ. May the righteousness you practice exalt you. Amen. May you never be the same again. Amen. May this righteousness confer on you the distinct aroma of favor. Amen. The distinct fragrance of favor. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May men favor you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May it be spoken to you as it was spoken concerning Joseph. Amen. He that was separate from his brethren. May the blessings come upon you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Joseph was separate. He got to where no other person got to. As you decide to live righteously. To separate yourself. To create faith environment. In your lineage. In your office. Wherever you live as you practice this. May God distinguish you with greatness. Distinguish you with favor. Distinguish you with wisdom. May the hand of the Lord exalt you. May the hand of the Lord exalt you. May the mouth of the Lord announce you. Announce you to your own people. Announce you to the right audience. May the Lord give your Pharaoh a dream. And may they not have peace until they fulfill that which God has spoken. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God said I should tell us the days of obscurity are not the days of waste. He's building the ark. He's building the ark. Don't go with the multitude. Don't go with them. Stay the righteous cause. Be the righteous minority. You are the light. You are the salt of the earth. You are the one who is preserving your nation, your neighborhood, your office. You are the light of God there. So shine. Don't be discouraged. I pray for encouragement for you. Amen. May God bring people your way. Amen. People of like minds. Amen. People that will uphold you. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In your business, in your office, in the works of your hands. May God bring like-minded people for you. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name. 
give Jesus a big clap offering somebody. Please join us this Wednesday as I continue on this series and we close up on Sunday. I perceive we'll pray a lot this coming Sunday. I perceive we'll do a lot of prayers. So come believing, come with expectation as you come on Sunday. In Jesus' mighty name. Have you been blessed today? Can you appreciate the Lord one more time? We close in Hammond declaring Psalm 133 from verse 1 to verse 3. Let's declare together. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head, the round down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hammon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For here in Hammon Christian Center, the Lord has commanded the blessing over us, even life forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy are with us. All the days of our lives, we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. In this new week, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. I declare that only glorious things are spoken concerning you. In Jesus' mighty name. You will be encouraged this week. You will receive encouragement. God will give you an encouraging news. God will give you an encouraging news. He will show you a sign for good. What I have, you have heard me preach. He will confirm it to you this week. In Jesus' mighty name. God bless you.